Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's a frigate cutting through the Caribbean. It's just before dawn and cloudless is the sky. The year is 1736, when the stars were younger than they are now and shone more brightly. And this particular sky of tropic brilliance was a navigator's dream. Land was close, and a trade wind bellied the mainsail and set the good frigate scudding. And daylight was just beyond the horizon. There, at the wheel, the helmsman, John Richardson. And holding his bottle for him was his small and drunken friend, Richard Coyle. The frigate sank in six minutes and drew sharks. The helmsman and his friend got away, only to commit other nuisances on the seven seas. So tonight, my report to you on Coyle and Richardson, why they hung in a spanking breeze. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The place went good with rum. It was hot. There were a lot of mosquitoes. And in every nook and cranny, there were dark-eyed beauties. It was necessary to fortify oneself. Beside which, Havana was under almost continual attack by pirates and buccaneers, some of whom stayed over because of the rum. So the town was peopled mostly, beside the dark-eyed beauties, that is, by trenchant cutthroats, deserting sailors, runaway slaves, uncaught murderers, and, generally speaking, black-hearted knaves. All in all, a populace dedicated to Saturday night. One of the fellows who just had Saturday night and was lying in an alley was a deserting seaman named John Richardson. That's John for you. And here comes Dick. Dick Coyle, a little man who robbed drunken sailors. Here he comes. Such a big one you are, mate. So much of you unconscious. Now let's see what you got in your pockets to make a small one like me more comfortable. Ah, now here's... Ah, gotcha, little weasel. Let me go! Let me go! Little scurvy. Going through my pockets, were you? How you want it, mate? Knife? Or just twist your neck? <laughs> Little sparrow, think I will twist your head clean off. No, mate. No, mate, listen to me. At what? It's an important thing I got to tell you, mate. Ah. Uh... I swear. And something to give you, too, mate. Hey, no. Hey. What? Ain't you, uh, ain't you? I'm John Richardson. What? John Richardson! John! Oh, John! Big John! How be you, John? What weaseling you doing, mister, to keep me from killing you? Now, why should you be killing me? For stealing my pockets dry. Oh, I was leaning close over you to see if you be Big John Richardson. Because I got this for you. What? This watch. This watch I'm holding up for you. Oh. See how it spins, John. Oh. See how pretty from a chain. Pretty. Gold. Pretty. And it's yours, big John Richardson. Take it. Go on. What's the matter? You weren't looking for me to give me a... Shh. What? Shh. What? There comes a sailor, John. 
With a sea bag, John. What of it? Who can tell what's in the sea bag? Jewels, maybe. Or what can be sold for money. Could you take it from him, John? Give me the watch, you said. You take that sea bag from the sailor boy and I'll give it to you. You swear. I do, John. Oh, I do. Now give me the watch. Now, first, let's see what's in the sea bag. Why, here's a pretty John. A knitted hat. Put it on, John. Do. I'll help you. There. How nice you look, John. And a friendship was born. And all over the Caribbean, people ducked when John Richardson and Dick Coyle came into town. However, there were the unwarned, the unwary. For instance, on a night in Port-au-Prince, a Lascar off a trader. You can pluck the earring from his ear, John. Get him. Oh, Lascar. Good, John. Huh? Hatch the boy, John. Help yourself. It looks fine in your ear. Or on a night in Roanoke, just when the colonists were finally going good in there with the Indians. Indians has got nothing. Have to hit a dozen of them before it's worth the night. And then, professionals that they were, they were ready for New York. And they made out well. The big city folks hadn't heard about them, so no one was ducking. And just when Big John and Little Dick were raking it in, so to speak, you guessed it, a woman. Put me down. <laughs> Put me down. Put her down, John. <laughs> He's a strong one, John is, ain't he, Bertha? Oh, yes. John. Aye. Would you like to kiss Miss Nolde? Aye. He'd like to kiss you. Oh, oh, oh. Go on, Johnny. <laughs> He's my friend, Johnny is. He's my friend. Dick. Uh, Dicky. Kiss her again, John. Kiss her. Now you listen to me, Dickie. <laughs> Dickie! Now, now, don't you do it, John. Don't you do nothing to me. I'll leave him be, John. I just want to tell him... I'm listening at you, John. I like this one, Dickie. Uh... I like to marry this one. I'll be blowed. I like you too, John. Oh, ask her. Ask her. You... Me, uh... Miss Nolan, my friend would consider it indeed a great honor if you give him your hand in Marion. Oh, I'd love to. Which are the events immediately surrounding the marriage of Bertha Nolding and John Richardson? They moved into a small cottage and took in one boarder. You know who, Dick Coyle. John was so enamored with Bertha that Dick couldn't get him to go out nights and do their routine on the docks. So soon, their money ran out. Let's go to sea again, John boy. Bertha. Yes, John boy? He wants me to go to sea again. Why? The money's run out. And... Why don't you go to sea again, John boy? And they got a berth on the good ship Malta Queen, shipping tar out of Boston, picking up sugar out of Havana and taking it to Florida. And one night, just before dawn, John was at the wheel, and Coyle was by his side. Have another, John boy. Drink here. <clears throat> good rum. Uh, Havana rum is the best. And uh, look what you've done. And what have I done? Now let go of the wheel and look at the zigzag you're making. <laughs> <laughs> come, wheel. Come to me, wheel. Wheel, spin. <laughs> I'll have you 
got nothing, John boy. After you, mate. Oh, no, after you. All righty. Havana rum's the best rum. Tell you what it does. Gooden's the eye. Do it, no. Gooden's the eye, eye. Gooden's it. Give you, for instance... Give me one, Johnny boy. Off the bow there. Rocks. The kiss of three sisters rock, they call it. No, well, when I sail and with... And you're thinking we'll hit it with the boaty now, the way we're sailing. I that I do. That we won't. Sharp eyes in me now that the Havana rum... don't you, in which the frigate sank in six minutes? It is interesting to note that the coral rock known as the Kiss of Three Sisters was later changed by seamen to Shark's Feast Rock, and so it remains today. Coyle and Richardson, however, clung to a spar and drifted to shore, the sole survivors of their grisly mistake. They were picked up from an atoll in Key West by a pirate band with whom they made fast friends as their personal philosophies were very much akin. In six months, Richardson and Coyle were back in New York, sunburned and broke. They made their way immediately to the little cottage where resides John's wife, Bertha. And what did you bring from me, John? I had your name tattooed to me. Now what a thing to bring to a wife. Dick here had your name tattooed to him, too. Now, did you, Dick? I right across my chest. Mrs. Bertha Richardson. Your love, the two of you. Now, I have a surprise for you. What be it? I've got 800 pounds. Oh. Have you now? My daddy, dear, died of the jumping blunders. Oh, poor man. And 800 pounds he left, did he? He did, indeed. And where's the pounds, me darling Mrs. Richardson? In the loose brick there. Keeping it as a surprise for my wandering Johnny boy. Come to me, Johnny boy. Aye. John? Johnny boy, I missed you. Do it, John. Her pretty throat, John. Bertha. John, do it. We'll have that money, John. Bertha. Bertha. That's the lad. Bertha. You've done it, lad. Bertha. Lad. Lad, John, boy. Let go, Johnny, boy. You've done it. It's here, John. The money's here, just like Bertha said. What a surprise for a homecoming. Good boy. As luck would have it, there was a boat leaving that very night for Italy. The Sorrento Dove, Captain Lucian Faber, master. The boys signed on. Three nights at sea, Dick Coyle got the first mate so drunk that all he had to do was lead him by the hand and... That's how Coyle's friend Richardson got to be first mate.
Italy in 1737 is where Richardson and Coyle made their next appearance. They were in a gondola being pulled down the Grand Canal, enjoying the sights and the company of Carlotta Faber. As was my husband kind to you? A question asked because Captain Lucian Faber was her husband. And Captain Faber was the master of the vessel that had brought the lads to Venice. I was kind to them. Ain't she a pretty one, Mr. Coyle? Ow! The captain asked, jabbing Dick Coyle with his elbow. Watch the elbow, Captain. And my mate stumbled overboard. I made Richardson there take his place. And when I lost my second in the blow off the Azores, well, I promoted Mr. Coyle. Didn't I, Mr. No! Please, Captain. And a fine mate, I'd say, Mr. Richardson did make. Ah, and you'd be saying through, Mrs. Captain Faber. Look at him there, sleeping like a babe. Big John Richardson. Bambino. Molte bambino. Molte, molte. Carlotta, you promised not to talk Italian when I come home. I've got no way of knowing what you said when... I said simply that Mr. Richardson was a large baby. Large, large. Captain. Uh, yes? How come you come to settle here in Venice, Captain? Carlotta, her home. She doesn't want to leave. I want to take her to Camden, New Jersey to live. My home. But the dear darling wanted to stay here in Venice. Molte, molte, molte. Huh? Well, what did you say, dear darling? Nothing. Oh, bring yourself here, dear darling, and lean against me. Come. No. Now, you just come here. No, no. Now, you don't have to be bashful about my if friend. If I will move, I will awaken this great bambino who has fallen asleep in such a way that I... Let's don't wake him, Captain. He'll just clutter up. Let's talk about what we started out to talk about. Yes. John and me always wanted to own a ship, Captain. Mm -hmm. What are you humming for, Carlotta, dear darling? I want to hum, that is all. Mm. Captain. Oh, well, yes. Uh, go on, sir. What were you saying? Well, John and me always wanted a boat. Ain't saying we got enough to buy a whole boat. Not a whole boat such as yours, but half a boat. How much you holding, mister? Six hundred pounds. Can't sell you no partnership for so little. Seven, Captain. I'm loading cargo tomorrow for Honduras, mister. Before I get clearing, I'm needing more than seven, mister. Eight, and that's all we've got. And uh, that's all I need. We'll draw papers in the morning. Good. Full partner. Full partner. And one of us gets hurt or dead, the share goes to the other. Agree. John. Johnny boy, wake. <clears throat> we own half a boat, Johnny. Ah. Half a boat. Uh, how did I get here? More. Now, mind you, Johnny boy, keep it on course. I... Hold the wheel as tight as if we your own lady. Aye. This ain't the Malta Queen to be run up on the rocks, John. This is our own ship. Ah. Uh, Johnny, boy. That's thinking you're doing when you say it's a shame only half the ship belongs to us. And such a shame, too. Aye. Aye, you say, and why do you say that? What could be in that thinking brain of yours? Huh? You said it was a shame only half the ship was... You said it, so it must be a shame. Shall I tell you why, John Boy? Aye. Because half a ship is half a cargo and half a profit. Aye. And the whole ship... Well, now listen, John Boy. We contracted with a captain. One partner dies, his share goes to the other. Aye. He's in his cabin, John boy. In his hammock. Peaceful. And? Let's have him an accident, John boy. Aye. No. Aye. Aye, Preble. Avast, Preble. 
Take the wheel for Mr. Richardson, mister. The captain's calling to us. Oh, it's a good day for us, John boy. You know who is a nice lady? Uh Uh-huh. The captain's wife. She's a widow you can marry with. Aye. Here. Oh, Mr. Hartley. Oh, what can I do for you, mister? A steward, you be holding the blunderbuss under lock and key. Aye. And so? Well, let's have it, lad. Let's have it. Only the captain asks for the blunderbuss and gets it, mister. The first mate here wants it. I want it. Only the captain wants it and gets it. John, boy. I... Such a big gun, this blunderbuss. Come along, John. It's a beautiful way to die, Johnny boy. Sleeping in a hammock with softy dreams. Put the muzzle to him, John, and send him on. Well, do it. Dickie. Do it. I can't. Chicken heart of a man, pull the trigger. Shoot his head uh, off. Uh, 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 trigger stuck. What, uh, what is happening here? Strangle him, John boy. Throw the gun aside and strangle him. Uh, no, you don't. No. Catch him, John. Shoot him, strangle him, run, put the gun aside, strangle him. Oh, which? What do you want me to do? Catch him, catch him and kill him. He's climbing the rigging, Dickie. Well, let him climb. We'll shoot him down from there like a nesting bird. Hey there, Captain. You know what's going to happen to you, don't you? Mean man, you'll sell to the death of all of us. Get the trigger fixed, John Boy. Aye. Aye, aye. Let me try to construct the picture for you. A picture first of frigate under full sail on the Honduras run. Sea, sky, ship. Now rigging of ship. Now on rigging captain of ship. Fresh from a noonday snooze in a hammock who, from force of habit, had time only to grab his plumed captain's hat. Scared. Below him on deck, Dickie Coyle and John Richardson. Dickie threatening the captain's life, and John fingering the trigger of a blunderbuss, which had a pretty good range. And now, gathering toward the scene of this nautical picture, the crew muttering, pointing, and wide-eyed. Now the picture moves, as the captain holds on with one hand and gesticulates with the other. Then... Listen to me. I am your captain. And you who have sailed with me before know, oh, how well you know that I have only your welfare at heart. Which of you has it in him to stand by and watch his captain perish? Which of you does not remember the storms I've sailed you through, the still seas and the torrents? And which of you could not come to me in times of stress needing advices or medicine, and I would give it to you. Men, I order you, seize those two men who wish to murder me and throw me into irons. I order it, and there will be rum in the forecastle when I get back on deck. You heard me, men. Select! The men, used to a ship where fair play had been practiced, only shifted their feet and listened just as attentively to what Dickie Coyle had to say. And Dickie Coyle said it. Get below, men. I'll divide with all of you what monies there are in the captain's chest. Get below. How's the trigger, John boy? Fixed. Overboard, John. (laughs) 
Now turn the boat around, John Boy, and let's go back to Venice. Finally, it is the two of you. After a year, it's been. Hello, ma'am. Molte. Mo- I cannot allow myself to say it. Oh, yes, you can. Your husband's dead, ma'am. You tell me this. Foot caught in a halyard, ma'am, and over I went. In a storm he was. Men begging him to stay below. They loved him so. But not him, brave fool that he was. Police! Ma'am, what are you saying? There came here a steward to my husband, from whom you wrested the blunder, but he would not give you. He has told me the story. How you shot, John Boy, we'd better run. We'd best leave here, John Boy. I'd like to read a translation from a Venetian chronicle of the time. Richardson and Coyle were apprehended by the local police on the Ponte Vecchio, where they were splitting a goatskin of wine. When taken in custody, they were dressed as gondoliers. In prison, Richard Coyle convinced his jailer that a terrible mistake had been made, that he and his friend were indeed servants to the King of Naples. They were released. Don't feel too badly, good man. Mistakes will happen. Come on, John. The King must be worried. Come, come. Only to be apprehended again when they paused over another skin of wine. And they were tried and found guilty of murder and mutiny. And one day, they were led in chains to a ship of the Navy which was about to sail. The order of execution had it that Richard Coyle was to die first. But there was a conference. You want to go first, don't you, John boy? Oh, well... Sure you do. I want to go first. So the order was reversed. And as the ship sailed to sea, they were hanged from a yard arm. And past the breakwater, they were cut down. John Richardson hit the water first. Tonight's crime classic was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed by Bernard Herman and conducted by Lud Gluskin. And the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Walter Tetley was heard as Coyle and Clayton Post as Richardson. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Herb Butterfield... Gladys Holland, and Charles Calvert. Gil Warren speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.